love is brought to perfection in us. Alleluia. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. The Pharisees approached Jesus and asked, Is it lawful for a husband to divorce his wife? They were testing him. He said to them in reply, What did Moses command you? They, they replied, Moses permitted a husband to write a bill of divorce and dismiss her. Jesus told them, Because of the hardness of your hearts, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, no human being must separate. In the house of the disciples, again, the disciples again questioned Jesus about this. Jesus said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And people were bringing children to him that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked them. That when Jesus saw this, he became indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not prevent them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Amen, I say to you, whoever does not accept the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it. Then he embraced them and blessed them, placing his hands on them. The Gospel of the Lord. In this first, re in this um, Gospel reading, Jesus is challenged about marriage and and all these things, divorce, and. Um, you know, he tells them that's the hardness of their hearts, the hardness of their hearts. You know, a lot, I know a lot of people today, are, especially in the media, think that, you know, the Pope is going to change everything in its teachings. Oh, the Pope is going to change this, the Pope is going to change that. Oh, listen, and then nothing happened. <laughs> he didn't change a thing. How long has he been Pope here? He hasn't changed anything yet. He won't. He'll never change the teaching on the Catholic faith, especially on marriage, just for appeasing humanity. Why does a church teach what it teaches on marriage? You know, it's, it's really to preserve the sanctity of marriage. And why is Pope Francis the way he is? He wants to bring people back into the fold and bring them the mercy of God so that they can repent and change their ways. That's the whole point of the Francis being the way he is, but he will not change anything in his teachings. I can guarantee you that. There's a reason why he met Kim Davis and encouraged her in practicing the faith. There's a reason why he went and vis visited the little sisters of the poor and encouraged them to live out their faith and to persevere against the the the, the mandate that the government has forced upon them. Jesus says, you know, it is because the hardness of your hearts. So when it comes to divorce, why is it, what is the poet saying? What is he trying to say? A lot of people, especially in America, we don't understand where he's coming from because we have to realize the rest of the world, outside of America, most people think as soon as you are divorced, you are excommunicated from the church. 
and therefore there is no, they think there is no chance of reconciliation with the church at all whatsoever when you get divorced. Most of the other world outside of the United States thinks that. And he's saying, no, they need to be reconciled back into the church. It is not so much the divorce that's a sin, but what you do to get divorced that's the sin. And then after they go to confession, a person goes to confession after the divorce because of the things, the ugliness that they do to each other, then you can receive communion. That's the point of it. It's not about going out and getting married again because it would be, it's right here in Scripture, you'd be committing adultery. And that would be a mortal sin to presume that you're on your own, on your own authority, without the magisterium, without the help of the church, and then you'd be committing adultery, and they'd be doing that. We can't be doing that. Absolutely not. But we want to bring people back to the church so that they can amend their ways. They can be reconciled to God and to each other. Divorce is ugly. Divorce is an evil. Anybody who's been through the divorce knows it's evil because they've experienced the pain and the suffering from it. It is an evil. Now, some people might have divorce parties, but it's only to drown out the suffering from a divorce. And they go on to sin all the more, which is a shame. But God does give them hope that they can be reconciled to God. When you look here in this first reading from the book of Genesis, the first reading we read here, it's interesting to see what we read here because this is really the foundation of what the church teaches. It's our understanding of what marriage is. It's founded right here in Scripture. It first starts off like, it's, good, it's not good for man to be alone. And it's not good. It's not good for guys. Do you imagine if it was just all a bunch of guys running around, no women to run around? That would be bad. <laughs> it would be bad if it was all just a bunch of guys. I mean, we'd probably be just a whole bunch of people giving noogies on each other's heads and, you know, or something like that, <laughs> playing football. You know? Okay. Um, it's not good for man to be alone. And so what does he do? Man realizes this. Adam realizes that it's not good for him to be alone. So God doesn't just show him immediately and just bring about woman. He says, look at all these birds in the sky and the fish and the animals. Look at all these animals and study them. So Adam goes out and looks at them. He names them and he sees them. He sees their nature. He understands what they are. And of all the other creatures in the world, he does not find a suitable partner. Yeah, it's great to have pets. We'll be doing a pet blessing later on today, but it's not the same as a companion for life in marriage. So when Adam discovers this, God the Father gives him that freedom to discover that himself. It's, it's just not, not quite right. He creates a woman out of the side, out of the rib, out of the side, meaning his equal. Out of the side comes this woman, right? And when it sees here, you know, the word woman isn't, whoa, man, she's really beautiful, right? It doesn't, that's not what it means, right? There's a companionship there. There's a respect. There's a dignity. And to know that God created a male and female. In God's own image, he created him. Now, what he's done here, he doesn't say, oh, I'm just going to create a male and I'll just create a female. No, he's establishing the family unit, He's establishing the domestic church where in the couple, the children and the family discovers God. Where the people and the children can look at you because you are in the image of God as a family, as a domestic church. Who is God? What is God? God is love. As you hear everybody chant all day, right? Love. God is love. God is love. Yeah, God is love. And you, as a family unit, are in the image of God. So now, when you love each other as a couple, your children should be able to look at you and say, I know there is a God because I see God, because I see love. And God is love. They should be able to identify the love that you have for each other and recognize that that is God. And that's what gave them birth. 
love. Not only that, not only is your marriage an image of God, a symbol of God, like the golden arches at McDonald's, it doesn't just symbolize that, it actually makes it happen. So imagine if the golden arches were a sacrament. This is what you call a, an efficacious sign. By seeing the golden arches, it would make the, the Big Mac happen. Just by seeing the golden arches. It would make the french fries happen just by seeing it. It would make the coffee just happen just by seeing it, if the golden arches were a sacrament. But it's not. So what are you an image of? You are the image of God. God is love. Therefore, the image of God in your marriage brings about, it makes happen, the love of God for your spouse. And that is what the marriage act is all about. That is its very foundation. That is its nature, to bring about the love of God for each other. Therefore, the marital act is you, what's happening is, as in, a, in a sacrament, when you do the marital act with your spouse, you're calling down upon, down from God, the love of God for your spouse. The love you have for each other is not your own, it is God. God is love, he is all love, he is the source of all love. You call down upon God, the, upon your spouse, the love of God, the love of the, of the divine. And therefore now you become a blessing. You call down upon God, God's blessing for your spouse. That is the nature of marriage and that is its sanctity. That is its holiness. This is what it's made for. When you look at it in this way, there will never be a day, ever, where the church will ever change the definition of marriage and devoid itself of its glory, of your glory, because you are made in God's image and likeness as male and female. If there was a couple who was married, couple who was married and they're of the same sex, it would be a denial if two men were married so-called married, it would be the denial of the female sex of being the image and likeness of God. If two females were so-called married, it would be the denial of the male sex of being in the image and likeness of God. Because they're saying, we don't need male, we don't need female. It is not part of marriage, the image of God. It would be a slap across God's face. And that is why it would be abhorrent to God. It would be trying to twist the image of God around into something it is not. Because the nature of marriage is the image of God. Period. God designed marriage, not humanity. And so that's why we don't follow our own way. That's why we encourage these people of same-sex attraction to, know, to give up that lifestyle, to be reconciled with God, so that they would no longer demean themselves in their sin and wound themselves in their own sin. When we sin, we wound ourselves. We hurt ourselves. We take away our own dignity because we're not acknowledging that we are made in the image and likeness of God. But they deny that. And so it's a big struggle to bring about reconciliation to these people who would deny that. But we encourage them to try to give up that lifestyle, to be indeed reconciled to God, to find their peace in following God's ways not man's ways. Pope Francis, is a, this last visit was an, was an awesome visit. I loved it. It was great. He was very loving. I was thinking about, you know, even, even as this uh, gospel reading, this whole reading is sequential. It all has to do with itself, you know. Um, Pharisees, what is marriage? Children. Marriage, right? Children are part of marriage. And then what... What does Jesus do? I mean, 
He welcomed them. What was Pope Francis welcoming, embracing these children? This whole idea of what family is and the nature of what family is. That's why you see him always embracing these children. Because children becomes from marriage between a man and a woman. And it has to be biologically, scientifically, a man and a woman. He knows that. And if you ever notice, he's a man of action, not words. Again, he visited Kim Davis. And he encouraged her to persevere in her faith. In faith in what marriage is. He visited the sister, little sisters of the poor in religious liberty to, and to say, no, we're not going to use to, to, to promote contraception or abortion. We're not going to do it, period. He encouraged them on that. Does that a, is that an action of a man who says, I'm going to compromise it? No. He embraces children, the fruit of marriage, the fruit of a faithful marriage between one woman and one man for the rest of the life. This marriage is your glory, and we should never, ever compromise for anything less.